Of the more than 74,000 disasters that the American Red Cross responds to each year, 93% of those are home fires. Um, that's approximately 170 home fires nationwide that American Red Cross is responding to each year. And the, dis the difference between a home fire and a national, uh, natural disaster is that most home fires can be prevented. And so today we are talking about home fires. I'm Glenda Atkinson, the Executive Director of the local American Red Cross, and I have with me today Steve Kyle. Uh, Steve, thank you for being with me um, to, to talk to us today about home fires and fire safety. Um, Steve has been with the, um, the fire department for 10 years. He was the fire marshal and now is our interim fire chief. And Steve, again, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Um, recently, the American Red Cross and National Fire Protection Association um, has just released a survey. And in this survey, it was discussing the fact that 79% of Americans now are concerned because of the economy and the downturn and, and all the concerns with the economy. They're concerned about heating their homes throughout the winter. Um, according to this survey, a strong percentage of those people will be using alternate methods for heating their homes. And of course, as people look to alternate methods, whether it's a, uh, a space heater, some of those other things, then certainly it adds on um, concerns, other concerns, because as you do, you take um, those other precautions to save money, then sometimes you're putting yourself at risk for home fires. And I wanted to talk today about several areas, and I know as uh, fire marshal and interim fire chief, you have certainly some concerns and know so much about how we can prevent, be, make our families safer, safer and we can prevent home fires. Um, the first area I wanted to talk about was heat and cooking fires. Um, is, would you say that that is possibly the number one reason for home fires? I mean, how would you categorize that? Well, those two categories certainly are the leading cause of fires that we have across the nation. Uh, I can spend a little time talking about heating fires uh, specifically. During this time of the year, uh, as the uh, season begins to change and it begins to get cooler, uh, everybody goes out and you know starts turning on their heat. <clears throat> Sometimes it's without having done proper maintenance on their uh, heating units before they turn them on, so we see some fires from that. Uh, the economy, as well as just energy cost in general, are a couple of the things that we see alternative heating sources being used for. They they can't afford to run the the big furnace that they have uh, that runs the whole house, so what they do is they uh, go out and buy space heaters in effect or they'll buy a ker kerosene heater of sorts and by deploying those in their home you know they'll heat that room that they're in and let the other rooms be a little cooler set the thermostat down lower than they normally would that's fine as long as you're sitting there awake the uh, where we see a lot of problems is people will go to sleep uh, they'll have them in their bedroom, using them for that. With kerosene, a particular hazard is carbon monoxide, as well as its proximity to uh, materials in the room, such as bedspreads or curtains or even furniture. Uh, you can have them too close, and over time, as they sit there and, and heat the area, they're radiating heat upon those materials that are in that vicinity. If they're too close, they can lead to a fire. Space heaters are another item. Those are electric typically they but they have the same hazards as some of the kerosene does just by the amount of heat that they radiate off of the little ceramic ones a lot of them have safety features so they get tipped over you know they'll shut off but unless you're awake monitoring that you have no way of knowing uh, how, how much space would you need between a a space heater and furniture or anything else around it, how much space do you need? You need to have a, a good three feet around the, the uh, particular appliance that you're using to just keep it uh, so that the heat doesn't project onto the furniture or the, uh, the throw that you have or the afghan or, or bedding materials that might be in the vicinity of it, at least three feet to keep it away from, and clothing too for that matter. So you need to keep that distance to operate it safely and so that it doesn't radiate, the heat. continue to heat those items until they catch on fire. 
Um, in this survey, it mentions that 36% of people with fireplaces um, have never had them cleaned <laughs> and um, do not have them inspected annually. Um, and that, well, let's speak to that first. As far as a fireplace, what is the proper thing to do? How often do you need to have it inspected and cleaned? Well, both your fireplaces and your furnaces should be inspected annually before you go out and start to turn them on. With fireplaces particularly, you're looking for a big buildup of uh, creosote in, in the chimney itself. Uh, bird's nests in, in the chimney, cobwebs, things of that nature that could catch on fire and eventually lead to your, the, the structure or the attic of your home uh, catching on fire. So having those things checked uh, to see if they're clean, to see if they need to be cleaned so that before you start that first fire in there for the season, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't catch the house on fire. So that'd be first and foremost. If you have a, a gas furnace, uh, that has, a, you know, obviously this is a, a fuel-fired appliance. It needs to be inspected annually for some of the same reasons, not because it's going to build up from creosote, but to make sure that it's operating properly and it's not putting gas into your home or, or um, putting carbon monoxide into the home. Um, both of these things are fuel-fired devices. They have distinct hazards that are associated because they're burning fuel, and you need to, need to get them inspected annually before you, before you fire them up. What about with a, with a fireplace, for example? Um, I know it's a real temptation, especially around the holidays, to um, have a nice cozy fireplace going and you're unwrapping your presents and I know um, it's a real temptation to just take that wrapping paper and toss it in there and <laughs> into the fireplace and burn all that paper off and um, that or maybe you've got um, Christmas stockings hanging by the fire, are those things that you have seen um, factor into a home fire? Yes, uh, uh, burning paper and having it strung out halfway across the room uh, has been a problem. A lot of times decorating the fireplace has been a problem as well. Uh, they'll decorate up their mantle uh, that goes across the top there and this, you know, typically that's done before they uh, do a fire for their first fire for the season. And they go in there and build the fire, and of course everything's fine once it gets once it gets lit. But as the heat continues to sit there and and uh, be generated, that stuff that's around the mantle and hanging off the sides of it can uh, be, can catch on fire. So it all depends on the type of fireplace that you have, the type of insert that you have, and whether or not the heat comes directly out the front of it or it's blown out by a blower system, but uh, or has another distribution system. But um, the bulk of them you see that they're just radiant heat, they're open for you to see and for you to feel and you have to be careful with the stuff you store around and hang on the fireplace. You know, um, data shows that four out of seven people who die in a home fire die during the months of November through January. That's, that is four out of seven in just one quarter of the year. So as we head into the fall and winter months, um, thinking about fire safety is so important. And I know that everyone um, believes, I think that they believe that they are having safe habits, but sometimes we just do things we don't think about. And whenever you have 1,200 on average, 1,200 children that die in home fires every year, it's something that we all need to take another look at. Um, not just children, but younger adults often, um, according to this survey, um, a, young adults ages tw 18 to 24 are more likely to heat the kitchen with an oven. Um, my thought whenever I read this survey was that um, obviously there are some college students that that probably are on a little bit of a tight budget as college students often are. Um, and that they are less likely to take precautionary steps like, for example, cleaning lint out of the dryer. Now, you know, what are your thoughts on the younger adults as well as like lint in the dryer and those kinds of hazards that we see? Well, with the younger adults, we, there's several areas that we want to focus on. Um, one, one is, of course, they're on a tight budget, particularly that age group. They, they're prone to use appliances in ways they were not designed for, like using an oven or a range for a, an alternate heating source. 
Yes, they'll put off heat. Yes, that'll work, but they they were in no way designed for that or designed to operate at those temperatures for that length of time if, that you're using it for. So uh, and a lot of times that will lead to a, lead to a fire. Uh, along that same line, cooking in those areas. Uh, with the younger generation, you know, we've got a lot more uh, technology available for us to be distracted by and unattended cooking tends to be a problem. And, and that spans many generations, not just the younger generation, but it's certainly a leading cause of fires that we have. You know, leaving the room, forgetting that we had something on the stove, and then, and then failing to come back to it until we have smoke filling up the home or the smoke detectors going off. So uh, there's not enough emphasis by really any of the generations on that. It's something that we, we seem to be very easily distracted by, especially this time of the year, the holidays, because uh, family's in, uh, kids are home, you've got a lot, of, a lot of distractions around. So uh, that being an important place of emphasis is uh, certainly very important to us. Well, and let's speak to cooking a little bit. Um, I know that from my experience with the Red Cross and, and the number of families that we have helped who um, experienced a residential fire because they had unattended cooking, um, most of the time it seems to have been because they were distracted. Not necessarily that they intended to just go off and leave something um, on the stove, but what percentage would you say of the fires that, that we see here in our in our area, in the Paducah area, do you think are caused by cooking fires? Oh, it's a large portion. Uh, we, a lot of the fires that we respond to are unattended cooking fires. And fortunately for, for us, we have a, a very a quick response time and a lot of times we're able to contain it to the kitchen. But a lot of the reasons we hear, you know, they put something on and they just, they just forgot about it. They left the room, they got a phone call, they've got kids and the kids were, you know, the, they were fighting and distracted them. Or there's been times where they just left. We've had people come back while we're fighting the fire or, or after we've put the fire out and they're like, what are, you do, what are you doing at my house? Well, you left something on the stove and you could see the light bulb go off over their head about how they feel about what they did. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of the calls we get, they come from the neighbor hearing the smoke detector mm -hmm. going off either in their house or apartment and just because they've gone off and left it. Do you think most people have a smoke detector in their kitchen <clears throat> and if so do they um, do they have it in the right place I know that in our home every time we use the toaster it seems like our smoke detector goes off it's very sensitive and so we're opening the door and trying to wave you know something in front of the smoke detector to get it to go off um, but I would think a danger in that would be that people would just simply disarm them. Well, they are, and that, they go too one often. of the things that you shouldn't do, and it depends on the design of your house, you shouldn't have one directly in the kitchen. And part of that reason is because of cooking, you burn things from time to time, or, or something happens and you set it off. It needs to be in an area just outside the kitchen, like your dining room or your living room, or even a hallway that connects it. Have it in those areas. And that, that, the, reason, the thought process behind that is, is that if you're in the kitchen cooking, you're in the kitchen, not away from it, or you don't leave it unattended. So you won't, you're, it's, a, it's a supervised area, in effect, where you don't have to worry about that. Um, making sure that you have them, though, is probably the second step of that. Um, put, them, put them in the, uh, in the living room, make sure you've got them in your bedrooms, hallways, and scattered throughout your house so that uh, they'll alert you if you have something going on. You know, a minute ago we, we um, <clears throat> spoke about the children and the number of children that die in home fires. Um, I have also had children that were the motivation for adults to get out. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember one family in particular that, you know, the, the father realized the dryer was on fire and his first instinct was, let me put this fire out, but it was because of the education that the child had had regarding fire safety that they actually ended up getting out of the home. And he said he was a little lightheaded when he did get out, um, but he got out because of the prompting of that, of that child. Um, the Red Cross has recently um, filmed with, well, actually with Seymour's Playhouse, a fire safety clip. Um, and it really is an educational piece directed for children and to help them understand the importance of preparing um, so that you can prevent fires. Let's take a look at that. Sure. A 
Okay, that one's ready. Uh, what are you doing, Seymour? Oh, I am just testing all the smoke alarms in the house to make sure they work. If there was a fire, the smoke alarm would make a loud noise like that one, and we'd all get out of the playhouse right away. Sweet. When there's smoke, there's fire. You know that's true. And we check our smoke alarm so they can warn you. If they smell smoke, even while you're asleep. When you check them, they should go beep, beep, beep. If you hear, get out, close the door. If there's smoke, stay down close to the floor. If you hear a smoke alarm, don't delay. Just get out. Hey, Lottie, we need to plan two escape routes from every room in the playhouse in case there's a fire. Well, uh, oh, we could go through the kitchen to the back door. Uh, yeah, that's great. You're getting this. Okay, now draw a line from the living room uh -huh. through the kitchen uh -huh. to the back door. So how'd you like that video? The video is very good. It brings up a couple of very important points. Uh, you need to have a plan. And that's one of the things that uh, the Red Cross and fire departments across the nation try to focus on, especially during uh, Fire Prevention Month, which we're in now, is that every home having a fire escape plan, knowing two ways of out of every room, and having smoke detectors on every level of the home. The, uh, the plan talks about some of those things specifically. Now, you saw the uh, saw Seymour testing the smoke detector, and I want to talk about that just real quick. We've got a smoke detector here. Most, battery, most smoke detectors that you see are battery operated or they'll be electric. If they're electric, they have a light on them. That is, uh, you'll see a, a, a spot on the smoke detector while it's on the ceiling or the wall and it'll have a light on it indicating that it is electrically powered. Those smoke detectors have the same method to test them as the battery operated do. You uh, just push the button and hold it and it'll go off like that. The electric ones and the battery oper operated ones both do that the same way. The battery are a little different though, that they're, and, and that's because they're battery operated. We recommend that you change the batteries twice a year. You've heard the slogan probably, chain, change your clock, change your battery. Smoke detectors are operated with a nine volt battery. They'll have an opening on the back of them where you can change the nine volt battery in them, just like that. It's a nine volt battery available at any local store. Put that battery in, close it back up and put it, put it back up, either on the ceiling or on the wall. They need to be, uh, if they're on the ceiling, you need to make sure that they're not close to a uh, air vent or to a ceiling fan and not too close to the corner. You wanna make sure they stay at least about six inches away from the, the corner of the, where the wall and the ceiling come together because that's a, a void space. Smoke rises and you would think it would fill everything up, but that area right there in the corner, it won't fill up. So you need to make sure that the smoke detectors are out a little bit uh, from the corner. Okay, and you said about six inches? About six okay. inches, yes. Okay, and you know, um, my experience has been that smoke detectors are really fairly inexpensive. Very inexpensive. You can get them anywhere from uh, about five or six dollars all the way up to twenty-five or thirty, just depending on the kind that you want. But the five or six dollar types work just as good as the twenty-five or thirty dollar types. So what, what tends to be the difference in those styles? Just the features that they have on them. They have uh, they have smoke detectors available for the uh, the hearing impaired. They'll have a strobe device on them. Um, there are special smoke detectors for uh, the, the vision impaired too. So you, there's a lot of, they have a lot of different things available to them. They have combination smoke and heat detectors, but your standard smoke detector, you can get for five or six bucks, very inexpensive, works great, and is a very small investment to bet your life on. Um, now, as I understand it, the fire department has a smoke detector program going on now, is that correct? That is correct, and, and actually fire departments all across the nation have various degrees of these types of programs. Not every fire department does, but most of them do. Uh, your local fire department in your area probably has one. We have one where you can call us, and, and ours is for, for city residents. You call us, tell us you need some smoke detectors. We'll, we'll come by and install them for you. So you, all you have to do is call us and make an appointment and we're more than happy to come by and put them up for you and make sure you're uh, safe at night. Now what, what contact information um, could you give us 
for people to call if they would like to have a smoke detector um, installed by the fire department? Sure, just please call Paducah Fire Department at 270-444-8521 uh, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. And just will, you'll give us your information, your address and your name and a callback number for us to set up an appointment for one of our fire trucks to come by and install the smoke detectors for you. Now, are there any qualifications or is that program available to anyone? The program is available to anyone. The, and I, I guess I should qualify that a little bit. It's geared towards single family residences. Your, your apartment buildings, they have different regulations and guidelines that they have to follow because they're a commercial structure. So they have to provide that already, and it's, this program is not intended for that use. Mm -hmm. However, if they don't have a smoke detector, we will make sure that they have one uh, before they go to bed that night. Well, great. I think that's a, an excellent program, and especially if there are um, perhaps elderly people or just anyone, really, that, that is unsure about where they need to have um, a smoke detector, exactly what room and the best place for it. I mean, that can be very helpful. Another thing that we're doing, Steve, at the American Red Cross is we're putting out information on fire safety tips. Um, we want to get this information out to um, just people in the community, uh, perhaps school children and um, it, it goes over tips that people can use about fire safety. Again, it addresses um, cooking, not leaving unattended um, food on the stove while you're, while you're preparing your meal, um, portable heating, um, portable heaters, making sure that you leave a space around the portable heaters if you are going to, in fact, use the portable heaters, um, electricity, electrical cords, um, extension cords. What do you see there as far as the greatest risk? Just extension cords themselves. A lot of times with extension cords, uh, they people use them and then they they once they plug them up, they don't ever do anything different. And you say, well, why is that kind of why is that anything wrong with that? Well, extension cords are designed for temporary use only. Well, what does temporary use mean? Well, we have a rule of thumb that we use, and if you're going to use it in that for that item or in that space for greater than 30 days, it's permanent. So if you're going to do that, you need to have a, an electrical circuit run with a plug-in for you to operate whatever it is you're trying to operate. Extension cord is just taking the circuit and placing it on the outside of the wall. They're not designed for that kind of use. A lot of times they're in high traffic areas where they're being walked over, the door's being closed over them, or the dog's chewing on them, or all the above. And over time, they start to break down. Now, the insulation on them, the sheathing on them, and what happens quite commonly is they're short out and a fire will result from that. So if, if you're going to use an extension cord uh, and it's going to be in place for greater than 30 days, it, then you need to look at it as it's not a temporary item. It's something permanent and you need to call a contractor and have an electrical circuit put in place. Well, and along those lines, it makes me think of the holidays coming up because many of us, and I say us because I'm guilty of doing this as well, um, we wrap up our extension cords and throw them in there with the Christmas decorations, pull them out year after year. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, maybe some kind of guideline in how long an extension cord should be used? How often should we replace those? Well, it's a, you're talking about for the life of the extension cord? Right. Uh, whenever you have an extension cord before you use it, you should always inspect it. And what you're doing in, during that time is you're looking to see if it was kinked uh, see if it's got cracks or it's frayed anywhere. And if any of those things have occurred, you want to remove that extension cord from service and replace it with a new one. Uh, certainly Christmas is a time that's a seasonal usage uh, and extension cords are available for that kind of use and, and that's okay to use them in that form. Just make sure you inspect them before you do. Well, and I know as we head into um, the fall and the winter season, um, people will be using, they'll, they'll be doing more cooking. They will be using things like candles to make their home smell good. Um, and there's just more activity inside their home. If you, if you could leave one message for people that are watching this show to really help them keep their family safe and really improve the preparedness within their own home, what would you tell them? don't go off and leave stuff like that on <laughs> or burning. Uh, the number one thing we see this time of year is are, 
or lights being left on and candles being left burning and unintended cooking. And it's just doing, making yourself aware of what you have going on in your home because a lot of people do a lot of decorating and there's nothing wrong with that. It's that time of year, we're festive and we're celebrating, but you just need to make sure at the end of the day uh, whenever everything's powering down mm -hmm. and that you take the time to go through your house and you power all of that stuff down. Is it important to unplug appliances typically? Does that make a big difference? No, not unless it's a, a space heater. Okay. Uh, space heaters, yes. Uh, and a good rule of thumb that you can do is uh, to determine if space heaters or even extension cords are giving you problems is feel of the cord. Mm. If the cord's warm or hot, then it needs to probably be unplugged. Steve, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, this is something that we talk about almost every year. Um, and with the Red Cross, we talk about it around, around throughout the year um, because it is something that we just all need to be reminded of. The local American Red Cross, on average, responds to about 50 disaster situations per year. And most of those are silent disasters. But it is just as devastating to that family as any other, other disaster because many times families have lost everything that they have. And the American Red Cross, in addition to trying to help educate the community on how to be safe, we respond to the single family fires by providing emergency, emergency sheltering for those families and give them financial assistance so that they can purchase food and clothing and meet their immediate needs. Um, it's because of the community's support and United Way support for the American Red Cross that we are able to respond to these disaster type situations. For more information on how you and your family can remain safe, please feel free to contact our office at 442-3575 or at paducahredcross.org. Again, thank you for being with us today. And Steve, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks.